There we go. Good morning, morning. Good to see everyone. So good to see everyone. Good morning, morning, morning. Had a fun start this morning as I was trying to get my Zoom open. As soon as I opened the thing, my computer told me that my Zoom was bugged and failing. So I did the fastest uninstall, reinstall right before SOAP. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> but so good to see everyone today. We are going to be diving into... 1 Samuel chapter 4, I'm going to be reading in the New Living Translation. Uh, it's going to give it two seconds and hop directly into it. As I'm getting myself settled really quickly. But as always, if a verse stands out to you, if God is saying something specific to you, we would love, 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 love to hear it from you. So be sure to drop it in the chat. Any questions, drop it in there. I've got mine open on the side here and ready to go for you. Again, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 4 today, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. All right, come on, let's dive into this thing. And let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are here to meet with you, that God, you've made space for us to come and be with you. And Lord, we don't come by our own merit. We don't come by anything that we've ever done. We are here simply by the blood of your son, Jesus. So, Lord, thank you for the sacrifice on the cross that paid for reconciliation of relationship so that we could see you face to face. And so that when you see us, you don't see us by our sin. You don't see us by the things we've done when we missed the mark, when we messed up. But you see us by the blood of Jesus. So, Holy Spirit, I just pray you would fill this time, fill our hearts, fill this space. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Reading from the New Living Translation. It starts off. It says, And Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. So they sent men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground shake. What's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We have never uh, had to face anything like this before. Help, who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slaves, just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. The Ark of God was captured, and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. A man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battlefield and arrived at Shiloh later that same day. He had torn his clothes and put dust on his head to show his grief. Eli was waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle, for his heart trembled for the safety of the ark of God. When the messenger arrived and told him what happened, an outri uh, outcry resounded throughout the town. What is this noise about, Eli asked. The messenger rushed over to Eli, who was 98 years old and blind. He said to Eli, I just come from the battlefield. I was there this very day. What happened, uh, my son, Eli demanded. Israel has been defeated by the Philistines. The messenger replied, the people have been slaughtered. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were also killed. And the Ark of God has been captured. 
When the messenger mentioned what happened to the ark of God, Eli fell backward from his seat beside the gate. He broke his neck and died, for he was old and overweight. He had been Israel's judge for 40 years. Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near her time of delivery. When she heard that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth. She died in childbirth. But before she passed away, the midwives tried to encourage her. Don't be afraid, they said. You have a baby boy. But she did not answer or pay attention to them. She named the child Ichabod, which means where is the glory? For she said, Israel's glory is gone. She named him this because the Ark of the Covenant has been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. Then she said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the Ark of God has been captured. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. What a packed chapter, right? There is so much that just kind of happens inside of there, everywhere from battle, Ark of the Covenant. Um, I will have to say this. Uh, I decided this last night when I was reviewing my notes. Uh, I had the privilege of going and teaching at one of our young adults groups in a little Q&A with the one and both the only Pastor Jason. And we get done and I go and review my notes and uh, verse 18 uh, struck me where it says, when the messenger mentioned what had happened to the ark of God, Eli fell backward from a seat beside the gate. He broke his neck and died for he was old and overweight. Um, you know, I say this avidly, especially when we were working through the book of Judges, that the Bible just doesn't simply hold back. Um, but this verse motivates me to lose weight because I will not have my God write about me <laughs> saying the overweight youth preacher, <laughs> come on, somebody, <laughs> right? In no way, shape, or form. <laughs> um Nah, just a little bit like morning laughs for you, but oh my gosh, the Bible does not hold back. He died because he was old and overweight when he fell backwards. I was like, oh Lord, you just, God, you have no problem writing the details to you. <laughs> Good, bad, ugly, beautiful. Um, but no, uh, so verse one, Samuel's words went out to all the people of Israel. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israel army was Cam near Ebenezer and the Philistines were at Aphek. So I just want to give you a little bit of history about the Philistines. Um, so the Philistines as a nation, as a people were descendants of Noah's son, Ham. And if you're familiar with the story of Noah, right? Genesis chapter four, uh, and it kind of follows through a few chapters after that God speaks to Noah cause he's the one righteous man left on earth and, uh, uses Noah to build the ark, preserve mankind as God in his mercy, uh, hits the restart button through the flood on the earth, right? So Noah had three sons. Uh, Ham, Japheth, and Shem, or Japheth uh, and Shem. So in these three sons, we know that, uh, you know, they go on the ark with them, uh, quote unquote, help them build it. They get off of the ark and covenant is made between the Lord and Noah, right? This is where we get the rainbow from. And shortly after this, Noah does the unthinkable and gets drunk. I can't believe it. Noah wasn't perfect. I can't believe it. Now, mind you, what Noah did wasn't right. But I I think what his sons do after him getting drunk is very interesting and noteworthy. So Noah gets drunk. He's in his tent naked. Ham walks into his father's tent and sees his father's drunkenness and his father's nakedness. And when he sees it, his first response is, oh, I'm going to go out and tell my brothers. So he runs outside and he looks at Shem and Japheth and goes, guys, you got to see dad. He's drunk and naked in the tent. It's wild. The other two sons don't think it's funny because the other two sons know what it means to cover people inside of their wrongdoing, to cover people inside of their sin and to take care of them. So what do they do? They grab a blanket. They walk him backwards so they don't see their father exposed, cover their father. And the very next day, when their father wakes up, he hears the news. He confronts the three of them, blesses Shem and Japheth, and curses Ham, right? And it's an incredible message and illustration as to how we should cover one another inside of our sins, not gossip about them and expose them away outside of the Holy Spirit, right? So Ham right here gets cursed, uh, may, mostly by his own character, and his own actions, because we know that unrepentive character and unrepentive spirits inside of our life will always multiply itself inside of our generations as we're, you know, multiplying and having kids, grandkids, et cetera, et cetera. This in time birthed the Philistines inside of the land of Canaan, 
right? So the Philistines were a gritty, gritty people. They were no joke. They were fighters through and through. And this is kind of because where they came from. They set along southeastern Mediterranean Sea between Egypt and Gaza. They migrated to the Middle East and were, were referred to as sea peoples by the Egyptians. This is because they would sail across the sea to get where they were supposed to in order to land. Uh, wasn't exactly the most common way of doing things. So, the, I mean, like, obviously people had boats and they'd be on boats. But for a people group to migrate the way they did through the Middle East to go ahead and plant where they did was uh, a little bit obscure. So the Philistines earned their this title of sea peoples by the Egyptians as they were uh, migrating, as they were going ahead and, um, you know, colonizing, they went started going inland because they wanted to press against the Israelites and obviously conquer more land. What this led to was they would conquer five cities inside of Gaza. These are in southwest Canaan. And as they were doing this, they started to become warriors. They were no longer just these fishermen that were gritty, that knew how to fight, that knew how to throw down a little bit, right? That knew how to conquer, that knew how to war. All of a sudden, they started turning into an actual military. Because as the Bible notes and as history would tell us, that these were the ones that started having iron chariots and organized infantry. <laughs> this wasn't just your ragtag guerrilla warfare, you know, lay down in the sand in the middle of the desert and pop out and start fighting people, right? This was iron chariots and organized warfare that the Philistines were using. The Philistines would be known as the big thorn inside of Israel's side throughout its history. You know, especially as we're unpacking first and second Samuel, you are going to hear about the Philistines a lot as we're going through these chapters. And I'm pretty sure I have mentioned this in the past, maybe three, four soaps I've done with all of us. The Israelites were supposed to wipe them out when they first got to the promised land. I, Church, I'm pretty sure I talked about this every single soap I've done in the past month or two. They would not be facing these issues if they had handled them when they were supposed to. The command from God was when you get into the promised land, drive out the peoples that are there so that you can take full possession of the land. But what happened? Comfortability, complacency, eh, they won't be a problem. We, con we conquered most of the land. What's the five cities in Southwest Canaan, right? But how often do we do that sometimes with our own sin inside of our own lives where we're justifying certain heart motives and thinking they're okay, right? Heart motives at some point will take us over, correct? This is same thing with the Philistines. The command of the Lord was to drive them out. They chose to do the opposite and let them stay there. Because of this, because of their own disobedience, these people be the thorn inside of the history of Israel. This is where we get the story of David and Goliath that comes out of the Philistines, right? And here, here's the bottom line truth statement. In their own strength, Israel was no match for the Philistines. Had they gone to battle with the Philistines when they first got into the promised land, the Lord would fight the battle for them. If you remember, when Israel entered into this promised land, the terror of the name of God was driving people out of their own cities. This was the terror inside of the people. And we see it even inside of this chapter when the Philistines hear about them bringing the Ark of the Covenant into, right, into the battlefield. They started trembling. Because they knew what God had done for them inside of the land. But Israel was sitting inside of disobedience. And I think that's really what brings us into verse 2 and 3. Obviously, it's not the battle. But their disobedience to not drive the Philistines out sets the stage for verses 2 and 3. It says, the Philistines attacked and defeated the Israeli, uh, army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp. And the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. So I, this question right here, I think is, I, I think it's incredible, but I also think it's a question that we ask probably ourselves in our own lives many times, right? God, why did you allow this to happen to me? 
God, why did you allow us to be defeated? And I want to share this with you uh, because I'm going to share the grace and mercy side with Jesus before maybe I necessarily share the truth side of this, right? Because I believe grace and truth are held in tension, but in the perfect tension, it finds its middle inside of Jesus. So the grace side is, if you've ever asked this question, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me right now? Lord, why am I not yet seeing breakthrough? Lord, I know I'm confident I'll see your goodness in the land of living, but I don't feel like I'm experiencing it right now. I want to share with you, so often breakthrough is on the other side. We have to keep pushing. And so often the Lord is teaching us things inside of that season that we would not learn anywhere else. And for us, we have to glean from the wisdom and revelation of Jesus in the middle of our hardships, trials, and tribulations. And I want to tell you, what you're going through is no accident. God knows exactly what needs to happen for us to get processed, right? He knows you so well, your heart motive so well, your mindset so well, that he will orchestrate events around you so that he will grow you into the image of Christ and fashion you. So don't write off and pray for de uh, deliverance from something that is making you into the image of Jesus. Sometimes we just have to say, yes, God, give me your spirit and your presence in the middle of it. And I'm confident that this will work out for good because I love you, right? That's the grace side. Now I got to show the truth side with you, church, <laughs> right? Here's the tension. Israel was in a different situation, okay? Because you might be in the middle of a hardship. And I want to tell you, it may have, it may totally could have been something that have fallen upon you, right? Sick family members, family struggles, relational issues that some people might just be bringing to us inside of our lives. We want to be the best Christ followers we can to them. This situation right here, why God allowed them to be defeated by the Philistines was because they were looking for God's defense in their own defiance. I'm going to say it again. They were looking for God's defense in their own defiance. The Israelites were defiant to the command of God to wipe out the Philistines from the land, right? They were commanded to go and drive them out. But because they were defiant to God's command, they were not going to receive defense from God. It's almost like saying, Lord, I'm not going to follow any of the wisdom inside of your word but bless me wherever I go, right? It's like saying, God, I'm not going to use your word to benefit my life and to give you glory, but God, you better figure everything out though. You know, they, this is exactly where they were at. You can't choose defiance and then be bewildered when God doesn't come through and defend you. Because think about this, if they had handled the problem when the Lord told them to, they would never need God's defense to begin with. Does that kind of make sense? Because if they had went ahead and driven them out of the land, the Philistines never would have been there for God to have to defend them. And in the middle of their own defiance, they look around and they don't say, man, you want to know what? We really should have done this differently. We should have driven out when we were supposed to. There's no accountability here, <laughs> right? There's no sitting there and saying, ah, maybe it's me, right? The first thing they say is, why did God allow this? <laughs> like, I, and, and like, it just makes me laugh because I can think of that in my own life, right? Like, I can't just look at here and say, oh, I can't believe they're, you know, they're thinking this way. How often do we think this way where we're living in our own disobedience and defiance? We're like, God, why aren't you pulling through? And he's just looking at us like, hey, wh why don't you start, um, you know, just living in a little bit of obedience and getting your heart posture and attitude right, correct? So, uh, uh, I think it's so amazing right here that God uses us in spite of us. You know, again, this is kind of like my grace side. The truth is looking for God's defense and defiance. God's looking for obedience. Um, I like reframing these sorts of things so I can uh, glean from spiritual lessons, right? Because even though they were in disobedience, God is always looking for our obedience. And we can trust that when we follow God's instructions, he takes care of the obstructions. I'll say it again for our note takers. When we follow God's instructions, he will take care of the obstructions, right? Because I don't want to look at Israel in pure judgment and say, shoulda, 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 when I could look at the mirror of my own life and say, ah, I really shoulda, 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 right? Because so often my heart motives are not in perfect obedience to the spirit of God. So often my selfish flesh works its way right into the situation and says, this is what you want. Get it done. Come on. I know I'm not the only one where their stupid flesh gets in the way and says, this is what I want to do. But we can trust 
that as long as we're trying to follow Jesus with everything in us, loving the Lord of our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength, and we follow God's instructions, he will take care of the obstructions. And God will always bless your obedience. You see, what Israel right here was looking for was the blessing of obedience on their disobedience. And the Israelites, rather than searching inward, they decided to go further into their own disobedience. And I think this is just like the pattern of sin. It's like pig and slop. They're nice and dirty. And what are they going to do? They're just going to get more dirty. Verse four. So they went, they sent men to Shiloh with, by the way, this uh, sarcastically brilliant idea to go get the Ark of God, to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the Ark of Covenant of God. When the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud and made the ground shake. Look at this. They went into the temple and took the Ark. Uh, this, when, when I read this, personally when i was going through this chapter i was grieved i was grieved at the lack of knowledge wisdom and total uh let's say blase heart posture of israel when looking at the presence of god the command of the lord was that the ark of the covenant would stay in the most holy place the most holy place would be entered once a year by the high priest because the presence of god was to be treated as reverent when the high priest would enter once a year, this is when he would do business with the Lord. But no one else was supposed to be going in to grab the Ark of the Covenant. And here they are grabbing the Ark. And there was no honor. There was no fear of God. There was no awe of God. You see, they were treating the Ark of the Covenant, the uh, right, the actual physical uh, creation. They were treating this, this symbol of God, as if it was his presence and his power. And I need to tell you, this was the idolatry inside of their hearts because they were viewing this physical object as God himself. When in all reality, when the battles were being won throughout the promised land, the Ark of the Covenant was not marched into every battle. They did not need the Ark of the Covenant with them. They needed their God with them. But they chose this idol over the actual presence of God. And this is kind of like my point of this. A symbol of God does not guarantee his presence and his power. By grabbing the ark, they were putting, they were not putting their faith in God. They're putting their faith in a symbol. And you see, all the victories, one inside of the book of the Josh in the book of Joshua, they had their faith in a God whose presence and power was with him. And I want to tell you, whatever you're going through, God wants to be with you in his presence and in his power. He does not want to be with you in a symbol. He does want to be with you in, in, let's say, all monetary, temporary things. He wants to be with you in his presence and his power. His presence is him. Jesus sits in the middle of his presence to give you his peace, his joy, his kindness, his goodness. So many times, all I can do is sit in the middle of his presence and breathe him in, right? In the Old Testament, there's a reference to Jesus or God, and it's Yahweh. And back then, they didn't use vowels. So it'd be Y-H-W-H, and it was to symbolize the very breath that we breathe. Yahweh was the right? This was to be the name of God, the very breath and substance of our being. You, his presence, sometimes the best thing we could ever do is just sit and breathe inside of it. And then his power is what he does, because I don't want power without presence. Just in the same way Moses in Exodus chapter 33 didn't want the blessing without the blesser coming with them into the promised land. Here, we need the presence and we need the power. The power is the clearing of the, uh, the enemies out of the promised land. The power is the defense of God when our enemies come up against us. In the same way, Psalm 23 says, my God will make a table in front of the for me in the presence of my enemies, right? This is the presence and power of our God. And whatever situation you're in, I want to tell you, you don't need a symbol. You don't need a ritual. You don't need that one thing that brings you comfort. You All you need is your God to sit there with you inside of his presence and his power to see the situation change. But their motives were off, and it reveals their heart posture because they did something that would grieve the Lord, and it was to go into his holy place, take something that was cherished and supposed to symbolize his presence with the people, with the people of God, but they decided to take it out and march it directly into battle. And what grieves me even more 
was that when the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant being marched into the camp, they shouted for joy so loud and made the ground shake. And as I read this, I thought their lack of understanding of the word of God, their lack of understanding of the heart of God, that they want the Lord wanted it to stay in a certain place, right? And here all the people rejoiced at a blatant sin happening in front of them and said, yes, we've got it now. And my heart broke. I was grieved when I read these verses. And I thought, this is exactly why we soap church. This is exactly why we break down the scriptures. This is exactly why we are a church that believes that the word of God is central to our preaching and teaching and letting the word of God speak for itself, speak the hope, dreams that God has for mankind and correct doctrine so that we can understand how to follow the Lord the way he wants us to. Amen. You see, the people here, the people here had gone so far from their true north that they did not even know that there was blatant, blatant, blatant sin happening in front of them. Instead, they cheered so loud, the ground shook. I want to fear God enough that when it's happening in front of me, I want to be grieved for his presence, not cheer out of my lack of knowledge, my ignorance of his own word. And that's why I'm so grateful to be a part of a church that at 6 a.m., we are on here soaping, diving into the word of God so that we can know this is right, this is wrong, this is how I'm going to live in God's best. Now it goes on in verse 6. What's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Covenant had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp. I think it's, when I read this verse, I, I chuckled to myself because they put a lowercase g when they said the gods have come into their camp. And at first I thought, you can't talk about my God that way. You better put a capital G on that and put some respect on his name. And then I kind of sat for a second and thought, no, they were correct. Because in this moment, Israel was worshiping a symbol, not the, the Lord God of Israel. So I sat there. I was like, this is kind of true. And again, it shows the idolatry of the heart behind the nation of Israel. The Philistines go on. They cried. This is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help. Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? Again, gods of Israel. Get multiple, plural, right? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians, Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, who become the Hebrew slaves, just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. The Ark of God was captured, and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. You see, right here, right here, this was the fulfillment of what God had told Samuel in chapter 3, right? So in chapter three, God tells Samuel, hey, the family of Eli, because of their you know, deceit, their disobedience, their wickedness, they were priests, but they were priests out of their own selfish gain and selfish nature. And because of this, the Lord says, I have to correct this. And his form of correcting this one was to take care of it, right? So right here, the Lord told us, told us about in chapter three and chapter four, we see it happen directly afterwards. You see... I think this is so interesting. And as I was reading this, uh, you know, it, this, this point started coming to my mind. God exists outside of time because the very chapter before he says, this is what's going to happen. The family of Eli is no more. He exists outside of time and he sees ahead of time because of that. And it encouraged me that when I enter into my prayer life, I am praying to a God that is not bound by the same minute I'm living in. When I'm sitting in 628 a.m. or you're sitting, if you're listening to this later on our podcast at whatever time it is that you're listening to, God is not bound to that minute or that second. God wants to give you revelation of what's going on inside of your life, what's going on in the lives of those around you, and give you prophetic insight to pray his will into this world. Because as Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has a desire for his will in heaven to be done here on earth. And we as Christ followers need prophetic insight and pray prophetic prayers from the God who sees outside of time so that we can pray his will into our current situations, into the lives of others, into our community around us. And he wants to partner with us inside of this. I think it's so encouraging that our God exists outside of time and wants to give us insight from where he sits. because. Uh, 
right? Honesty hour, truth moment. I more than likely give God insight from where I'm sitting and saying, God, you know, you should really do this, <laughs> right? And I have a feeling I'm probably not alone. You know, if we all know our ways are not his ways. My thoughts are not his thoughts, right? His thoughts are higher than ours. But at the same time, so many times, my like, God, you know, this would really make the most sense if you did it like X, Y, and Z. But as I was reading this, it was convicting me. And I started thinking, no, our God exists so far outside of time. And we should be praying from prophetic insight that he's giving us from his eternal stance rather than us from our temporal stance. It goes on. Verse 12. A man from the tribe of Benjamin ran from the battlefield and arrived at Shiloh later that same day. He had torn his clothes, put dust on his head to show his grief. Eli, waiting beside the road to hear the news of the battle, for his heart trembled for the safety of the Ark of God, which I do honor his heart posture. When the messenger arrived, told him what happened, an outcry resounded throughout the town. They had lost the Ark of the Covenant. They had lost one of the most important things that was supposed to symbolize the presence of God in the midst of the people. This presence was supposed to encourage them, strengthen them. This presence was supposed to be central to the people so that everyone had equal access to the presence of God, not like the high priest to go into the most holy of holies, but so that the people could come to temple and meet with the Lord. And here they lost it. There was no awe. There was no fear. There was no defending the ark of God, but instead allowing it to be marched out into battle. And it breaks my heart, but not to spoil it because it is going to come up soon, but God is so good that whenever we make mistakes, he always restores. And there's always a path of restoration because we know as time would go on, David would find this ark inside of a man's house and he would march this ark right back to where it belongs. And he would make sure that the presence of God became central to the nation of Israel again. David was a man made for war and he warred for all of the right things. And one of the things he warred for was that the presence of God would be central to the people of God again. So no matter what we find ourselves in, no matter what situations we get ourselves in, right? Because I can look at the enemy all day long and see how he's attacking my life. But so many times the greatest enemy in my life is the inner me, right? It's the person on the inside, that flesh that's getting in the way and that stinking thinking that won't stop framing things with negativity. Can I get an amen from somebody? So I know I'm not the only somewhat sinful person here, <laughs> right? Right. I'm a saint who sins sometimes, right? In all of our disobedience, there is still a God that restores us. Psalm 91 says that he rescues us from the snare of the fowler. What that means is this is a trap that we get ourselves in. And so often the enemy isn't the one trapping me. I'm trapping myself, right? I'm the one stepping into it. I'm the one getting myself in situations that don't, that God never intended me to be in. But God is so good that he releases us from the snare of the fowler so that we could live for his glory, live in his presence and see his power and his goodness here in the land of the living. You see, this story of the Ark of the Covenant, the story of Israel would never finish, which is the Ark being stolen and the people crying because God is too good to let the story end that way. And I want to let you know, no matter where you're at, no matter what you have going on, God is too good to let your story end where it is. There is an eternal glory on the other side where every tear is wiped away. There is an eternal glory on the other side where there is no sickness, but only the presence and power of Jesus. And you might be waiting for that situation to turn around. You might be waiting for that person to come to the Lord. I want to tell you, God is working it out for good for all those who love him. So what, what do we need to do, church? Keep on pressing into the presence of Jesus. See his power manifest here inside of the land of the living and trust that as we are practically putting his word and his commands into practice in our lives, right? Following his instructions, the obstructions will be cleared in front of us. God will not let your story, the story with your name on it, that is supposed to proclaim his glory. As the New Testament says, you're a living letter and epistle to mankind. His signature on the bottom of that letter is not demise and the presence of God just being ripped from it. The signature on the bottom of that letter is a signature of hope and a signature of restoration. And in the middle of this story, as we're reading, I mean, we've been in some rough chapters in, in our soaping, correct? Because each one is like, 
how long are they going to keep disobeying? <laughs> Can someone get on the scene and fix it, please? Right in the middle of all of that, there is a God that is working all things together for good. There is a God looking to restore, and that is the same thing with our stories here on earth. So, I want to encourage you today no matter where you are, what you have going on, God is working it out for good. All we have to do is continue to love Him, press into Him, trust His presence, and, and, and embrace His power inside of our lives. Amen. All right, come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for everyone that's tuning in today, God, no matter where we are. Maybe we are like the Israelites, uh, so deep in our own sin that as was shared in the chat, it just seems normal. When disobedience just seems normal. Lord, I just pray, renew our minds today around your word so we could see our sin differently. So we could see it like you do. And even now, as I'm praying, I'm, I'm reminded that when Isaiah was before the Lord, he said, God, rub a hot coal across my lips so that I may, that I may not speak in sin against you. God, so many times we, words just leave our mouth and we have no idea what we're saying without even the wisdom of what Proverbs tells us that in the multitude of words, sin is present. So God, I just pray purify our speech today. That Lord, as we're as we're talking, we're not just talking empty words, but Lord, that we're speaking life giving words, words that would build people up. Because I don't want to be like the Israelites and be so deep inside of my own sin, so deep inside of my own disobedience, that I miss what your commands tell me to do. So God, I just pray, give us your presence today, give us a heightened awareness that you are with us today, that after we leave this Zoom, you are not leaving us. That, God, you are with us continually, and you don't want to depart, but you want to give us revelation for the moment that we're living in. And, God, I just pray for everyone that might be going through a difficult situation, a trial, a tribulation right now that feels like it's weighing down on them and beating them down. God, I just pray for your goodness here in the land of the living. God, we just pray for healing to sick bodies. We pray for hope in the middle of despair. And, God, we pray for your presence and your power to be so active inside of our lives and we ask us to pray this in jesus name come on everybody said amen 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 god bless you all love you guys have an amazing thursday